Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, Oracle Marketing Cloud, helping businesses use the latest marketing technologies to tell their stories and connect with their customers. Sixter, allowing marketers to automatically inject clickable images called campaigns into every one of their employee email signatures to promote their company's most important initiatives or content. And by Zignal Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co. And today's special Business of Story guest. Welcome, I'm Park Howell and I'm so happy you're here again with me today on the Business of Story. You know, my job is to connect you with the top storytelling minds in business who share tips and techniques to drive growth for your professional services firm. That's what we do here at The Business of Story, and we would love to do it with you. We're available to help you with story strategy consulting for your brand, webinars and workshops for your people, and speaking engagements for your gatherings. Just let us know. Our goal, either through this podcast or working with you one-on-one, -on -one, is to reignite your one true superpower storytelling, so you can nudge the world in any direction you choose. Learn more at businessofstory.com, where we have a utility belt of storytelling tools for you to download, all to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. Now, on today's show, we will learn how to use the power of teaching overselling to advance our missions further faster with learning expert Margie Meacham. Margie teaches multinational corporations how to use neuroscience to better connect with their employees and their customers. Today, we're going to be talking about why pictures are truly worth a thousand words to our brains, why emotion is so essential in the learning process, and how stories are the only true vehicle we should use to truly move people to action. Finally, do you know where the term genius comes from? Well, if you stick around at the end of the show, you will find out it's pretty interesting. So without further ado, learning expert, Margie Meacham. Well, welcome to the show, Margie. Thank you, Park. It's really nice to be here. So as I mentioned in the intro, you are an online learning expert. What is that exactly? And why should business people care? Well, first of all, business people should care about learning, period, because if their folks aren't able to learn and to learn quickly there's just no way they're going to be competitive in today's markets everybody knows we're just getting hit with more and more information but you might not know the exact numbers just to give you an example in the last five years most human beings have been exposed to more information than the entire human race up till then that's how much we're experiencing. Of course, we're not absorbing it all. We're not using it all. We're not applying it all. The more you can help people learn, the more effective and competitive your business is going to be. So that's why they should care. Why do they care about online learning particularly? It's because it's so much more efficient because now we have virtual teams. You could have a global organization. You can have people working anywhere at any time. And so it's very difficult to get everybody together in one place for the old-fashioned traditional classroom training. So more and more of it is going online. However, more and more of it is not very effective because people don't really know how to do it right. Well, that brings me to my question. This show, of course, is all about the business of storytelling. And online learning has been around for a while. E-learning has been around for a while. What has the industry learned about how to use story to make it more impactful? Well, what the industry has learned, I think, is really going back to what science has learned, and that's about how the brain works. Because in the last 10 years, we've had an enormous explosion in understanding neuroscience. And you, you read an article every day, you're hearing things, you're not seeing a lot of it being applied quite yet. But what we're starting to understand is the power of story is a physical connection in your brain. More and more, we're looking at how the brain works physically and things that we suspected were just sort of mental processes turn out to be really physical processes where cells are having electrochemical connections between each other and we call that firing when we look at a, a live brain in an mri machine we can see where the activity is taking place and the remarkable thing about a story is when someone's listening to a story 
their brain reacts in the same places as it would if they were actually living out those same events. So you can have some really powerful experiences. You can teach people how to be better leaders or salespeople by walking them through a story. They don't have to wait until years of experience accumulate to learn those skills. They can learn through story. Have you always been in this realm? Well, you know, in one way or another, yes, but it's kind of a... It's kind of a funny journey mm -hmm. because as a little girl, I actually sort of struggled in school. I had a hard time learning how to read, and I didn't know it at the time. I didn't find out till I was in college that I was dyslexic. So, you know, I switched letters. I switched numbers. I had some challenges, so I had to work extra hard to get good at school, and that made me want to be a teacher. So here I am sitting in college, and I'm learning how to be a teacher, and they spent about 30 minutes on learning disabilities. That's about all they gave us. And uh, I said, wow, that's me. I didn't know that. So here I am ready. I've got my degree. I'm so excited to be a teacher. And I had to do something with my summer. And I took a job as a salesperson. And I, it just... Selling what? I was selling um, high-tech uh, connections for AT&T. And we were just getting into broadband. And I was comfortable with science, so I could understand the technology. And very few people could. They thought it was just like magic. So I was selling T1s and T3s. And, and had you um, ever been in the sales business never, before? No, never. I had jobs as a waitress in, you know, in high school. That was about it. Uh, and I think what really made me successful, I, w I became, here I'm a college intern. Nobody expected anything of us. We you know, we were just out there to beat the bushes. And I was supposed to be bringing in leads for other people, but I would close them. I kept closing them. And the reason I was so good is by the time I finished explaining how the technology worked, then, of course, they wanted it. They saw the benefits. So that's when I began to realize that selling and teaching are really two sides of the same coin. Do you have a story within that that you remember from back in those days of how this came together, where the teaching and the selling worked. Well, yeah. Um, I went out to a place in New Mexico, and this guy was running a school. So I was kind of excited because I you know, was a little connection to what I thought my, my real chosen field was. I got to see his school. And the problem he had, he was a boarding school, and the kids were trying to stay in touch at home on the one pay phone, and they were always lined up to make a call back home. So, you know, what I had to do was understand what was going on, and I explained to him that, because uh, then he was reimbursing them for the costs of these long-distance calls, that we could put phones, you know, in every room, that they could use a calling card from their parents. You'd actually be saving money, you know, than doing it the way you are. Saving money with a high-tech solution would make the children and the parents happier. And as I started talking about that, I, I really got the, I got to see the light bulb go on inside his head and that's something that I've always loved to do because when a light bulb goes off in someone else's head it goes off in yours too at the same time. How's that work? Well something that we also learned from neuroscience is that the teacher learns as much as the learner when it's really happening. There's uh, the two brains actually start to um, their wavelengths start to move in rhythm with each other. So when you talk about really connecting with someone or being in sync with someone, that's not an accident that you use that word. Your brains are actually synchronized. And when that happens, when you see how someone reacts to what you're teaching, you begin to discover things about, wow, you know, next time I'm going to emphasize that more because that's what really connected with him. And their learning and you're, you're seeing that you're both learning. And so if the teacher or mentor or manager is really connecting, they should feel they're getting as much from it as the person they're working with. So did you have to override sales training that they gave you as this intern coming in and somehow tap into your innate teacher to be successful? How'd that work? Yeah, you know, that's interesting because especially at that time, most sales training was about manipulation. And it was about say this magic word, put a pen in their hand so they'll sign, you know, um, sit a certain way to, to reflect their body uh, movement. Mm -hmm. um, the body language thing was really hot. And I just really just ignored all of that because it was so uncomfortable. And, you know, I thought, I'm just going to get fun. I'm just being paid to go out and talk to people. So I'm just going to go out and talk to people. And it turned out that that's 
exactly the best way to sell. So I never went to that teaching job. I stayed with AT&T, and I stayed with them for five years and uh, got successively better and better territory, so I made more and more money. And they finally asked me, would you train other people how to sell the way you do? So then I went into sales training. And then from there, I realized I like all kinds of training, and I found myself back in the world as a teacher. I went back on my master's degree in education and started consulting on all kinds of topics, just helping people learn. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I, before this Uh interview, we got a chance to kind of take you through our little process because we wanted to identify what is your number one specialty. Is it okay if I share that with the gang here? Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say that was a wonderful exercise. And anybody who needs some help figuring out their brand should be coming to you because <laughs> well, I, I really got a nice uh, freebie from that. So thank you very much. Well, no, 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 no. Absolutely. Uh, it's always so fun to do this. Um, and we've had a chance to chat a couple of hours before this as we we're talking about putting together a, a, a collective online course. So um, I asked Margie, what is your number one specialty? And she mentioned a, a lot of operational things like we all do. We default to that. And I said, that's good. That's what you make, but what I'm really curious about is what do you make happen? That becomes your number one specialty. So I asked you, I said, all right, what industry are you in? What industry? I'm in education. Now you're overall your education. Yes. And your category within the education industry is what, Margie? I'm an online learning expert. An online learning expert. And you do a little bit of work in a classroom, but 80% of your business is online. So we know yeah. that we can start really focusing that. Education industry, an online learning expert. What's your specialty as an online learning expert? It's the practical application of neuroscience to learning. And I, that's really interesting to me, the yeah. practical application of neuroscience to learning. And that led us down a conversation of when you're working with teachers, teachers are categorized as teaching. They're content experts sharing content, teaching content. But as a learning expert, teachers could really turn that on its head and say, you know, actually, when I learn the neuroscience behind teaching, I become a learning expert. I'm an expert at helping your child, helping the student, helping the PhD candidate become an expert learner. So I thought that was really interesting. And then that boils us down to your number one specialty. And what's that, Margie? Uh, my number one specialty <laughs> is I'm, I'm the top resource, really, to realize the genius in everyone, to create that spark. And that's what I love. We were talking about genius a little bit earlier. Um, And you came up through the sales ranks, teaching, sale, but you found that teaching is the best way to sell. sell. And aren't we all really salespeople, whether we're selling education or we're selling a brand or product? It comes down to selling, but teaching seems to be really the golden rule, if you will, to make people, to get people to buy into what you want them to. Yeah, that's so true. And it's, you know, we're all teachers. So we're talking about managers. We're talking about leaders. We're talking about you have to sell your ideas to your peers even. Mm -hmm. Um, The most inspirational leaders got people to buy in. Mm -hmm. And many of them were also very successful, overtly successful salespeople. There's no accident to that. Mm -hmm. And I think selling sometimes has gotten a bad name because of some of those old manipulative tactics. But today, most of us understand that that's not the right way to sell anything, that Mm -hmm. you've got to get people to take ownership of that product or that service. The only way they do that is if they understand it and they recognize the value that it has for them. So that's teaching. Now, we're going to take a break here for our wonderful sponsors. And when we come back, I want to talk about this idea of genius because I love where we landed on your number one specialty. Margie is the number one resource to spark the genius in everyone. And the argument is not everyone has genius in there, in them, but you don't agree with that, do you? No, I don't. And we can talk about it after the break. Great. We'll be right back. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. 
For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in just one place. It also helps you market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, it drives sales. Try ACT for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise-canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Margie Meacham. Uh, Margie, we have d- decided, we have identified that your number one specialty in the world is the resource to spark genius in the most surprising of places. Yeah, that's right. And the most surprising place for most people is right inside their own brain. So tell us, what is the root of genius? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from you, from who you are. Uh, All of us, we have the brains we have because as a species, we evolved that way to survive. We have these incredible powers. Like you talk about story being a superpower. Mm The one true superpower we all possess. Absolutely. And the reason we possess it is because our brain is able to imagine things and feel as though they're real. And so far, we've not noticed that ability in any other creature. And it's what really sets, it allows us going into a situation to have prepared ourselves. So if I'm going to do a public speech, I can picture how it's going to feel so that I gain confidence. It allows us to empathize with other people. That's why you can be a good leader by understanding how someone else might be feeling. You don't have to have experienced their exact situation to have empathy. So all of those skills come from within us, and they come remarkably from Physically, the the mechanics of having one neuron talk to another neuron across a little space, and it sends an electrochemical charge. You know, that's why we talk about it as a light bulb. That's why we talk about br- people being brilliant. We have always sensed that there were these lights going on in our brain. You can feel it, especially if you become more aware of it and you become more intentional. You can actually tell your brain to rewire itself, and it'll start doing that. Now, what does that mean for somebody who's running a business or is leading a team or aspiring to achieve a great goal? If you can understand how your brain works, now you understand how everybody's brain works. And now maybe you maybe you organize your communications a little differently. Maybe after you understand what eye contact does to beginning that connection, that wavelength synchronization, maybe you're a little more careful about making eye contact. And now you're doing it not because some sales trainer told you that it's more effective if you make eye training, eye contact, and so you're just staring you know, blankly into someone's eyes. You're really looking to understand them, to get to know them, and you care about them, and they can see that, and they can tell the difference between someone who's going through the motions, trying to appear caring because they want to sail from you and someone who really does. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more fun to go through life connecting with people than manipulating them. That's not satisfying either. We're built to connect. So as leaders, as managers, we're often told to leave those emotional feelings at the door, and that's absolutely wrong. Your brain needs emotions in order to learn. And all learning has a learning component that is emotional. Uh, that's why stories are so powerful, because they bring out emotions. It's, we could state the facts in less time, right? But if you weave those facts into a story, at the end of it, they're motivated to do something as opposed to just having a string of facts and not knowing what to do with it. Now, you work with a lot of big brands, big organizations on their internal training primarily, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. What, what have you seen has changed in the past couple of years through the better understanding of neuroscience and how they're approaching that training? Well, um, several things. One of the things that I've noticed, there's a lot of interest in something called micro-learning, which is shorter and shorter online learning. Now, as a rule, online learning should be shorter than classroom anyway because people are sitting in front of a computer 
the what we call cognitive load is much greater. There's uh, more things they have to pay attention to, and it's harder to hold the attention on the content because we don't have all the same tools. We can't go over and touch somebody, or we can't have them get up and dance around, or at least it's a little harder. You and I are talking about some ways you actually can build that into online learning, but most people don't go through the trouble. So because of that, if you're going to teach people primarily online, it's good to make it very, very short little bursts. So I'm seeing a lot more of 10-minute videos instead of an hour video. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be you know five or six of those videos, but they'll get breaks in between. So really chunking down the information. Also, managers are getting a lot better at running a virtual team. And by doing that, they can convey a lot of informal learning. And now they're doing that in maybe a WebEx or an Adobe Connect. They're doing that in a live interactive online meeting where they used to call someone into their office. Well, there's a different set of skills to make sure everyone has a chance to talk, to maybe throw up a picture and let people react to it or show some statistics. We process information visually 60,000 times faster than when we read the words on a page. So if you really want to convey something, you use a lot more pictures. That's one of the things I really encourage my clients to do. Um, unfortunately, there are still a lot of business people who think that giving a good presentation is about putting as much information as possible on every slide. And I, I know you're chuckling because you <laughs> run into that too. <laughs> Bullets yeah. are the death to PowerPoint. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, um, a lot of people hold on to that, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I am seeing it gradually change, especially if you can show them, well, here's your presentation, and here's what I did with it. You know, they get it. They see the difference. Are you seeing a change in the workforce, uh, younger, the millennials coming up through, and them demanding different ways of learning because they've been yeah. brought up on video games and their mobile devices and that sort of thing oh, yeah. is a way of doing it. It just doesn't work. It, it's, um, their standard is so much higher. They really expect to be entertained as well as taught. Um, and they're hungry for knowledge. They want to be taught. And they often make their decision of who they're going to work for based on how much am I going to learn from this person. And then they expect the money to come. So they really have a very... Uh, insightful view of, of work. And it's a lot different than some of us who grew up a while ago that, you know, where we focused mainly on the money and then realized halfway into a career that we needed to keep developing. No, oh, they're, they're right there. They want to learn, but they need to have fun. And the good news is that when you are learning, you get a little rush of chemicals that make you feel good. It's the same chemicals that have fire when you eat chocolate or have an orgasm. Again, like dopamine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's more, but dopamine is one everyone knows. Oxytocin uh, is one that Paul Zach talks about mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, and that has more to do with that connection yeah. uh, high that you get. So they want that. And if we give them these lame PowerPoints with a voice talking over it, they tune out. And it says something to them, not just about that individual learning experience, it says something to them about their the whole organization, that you would even dare to put that in front of them. You know, you lose some credibility with them. It's going to be harder to engage those employees because of that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Dr. Paul Zach earlier. He's a, a mutual friend of ours. Uh, he was on the show earlier. If for you listeners out there, if you don't know of Paul's work, check out his TED Talk. He is the uh, he found the oxytocin, the neurotransmitter oxytocin, and has done some amazing studies about how when we get oxytocin emitted in the brains of our audiences, that it creates this trust bond between the audience and the speaker. And you mentioned earlier, the best way to do it is through sex or hugs and kisses, which isn't, aren't always appropriate in the boardroom. But the next best thing to all that is telling stories mm -hmm. and, and connecting into the emotion of people's minds, as you had mentioned earlier, Margie, about them living a story um, just as if it was actually happening to them when you they're really bought into that story. And that releases oxytocin and creates this trust factor between the presenter, the teacher, the salesperson, whoever it might be with with their audiences. Yeah, absolutely. And another cool thing that happens with that story is our brain um, is built 
to predict what happens next. We're always scanning our environment. This is to keep us alive. Mm -hmm. And so if we see a rustle in a bush, we start wondering what that is, and we start building assumptions about what it might be. We can't help that. That's how we work. So when you're telling a story, your, your listener is imagining different outcomes and different options that this protagonist has. And so they're not just playing out the one scenario you're teaching they're playing out multiple possibilities in their heads and then with each new piece now oh okay we're going down that road so now i build a new um presumption about what's going to happen next and the more you can surprise them so that they get a conclusion that might be a little different than what they expected the more they're going to learn mm-hmm. you know um Robert McKee, who's been on the show as well, legendary screenwriting coach, said, our conscious mind is simply the PR department for our subconscious where all the real decisions are being made. And so people are going to arrive. They're going to play those tapes in the background of what's happening, what's trying to predict, what's going to come next. And if we're not crystal clear in our stories and the moral of the stories and the learning behind those stories and training, they're going to make up their own minds as to what they think we mean. And probably 90% 90 of the time are going to be incorrect. That's right. And really, everybody, it's called constructivism, and everyone constructs their own world. And we think we're all walking around in our own reality, but we're not sharing that reality with each other. So what matters to you, what you take away from watching a movie, for example, since we're talking about stories, might be very different than what I take away. I, re- I often see this with my husband. We'll both watch a movie, and I keyed in on maybe the... Uh, romantic subplot, and he was focused on, you know, they beat the bad guys at the end, they won <laughs> the, the world. Scene. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we both look at it differently, but we both enjoyed it. And I often have to t- explain to him, here's what the relationship is that's going on in the background. He's like, oh, I guess that matters. <laughs> you know, so <coughs> Typical guy. That's, yeah. that's what we say. We're looking for the explosions. There and the you go, and yeah. The so why is he and... blowing this up? Well, it's because he's mad because they killed his girlfriend, you know, or something. But the um, in business, the way that translates is exactly what you said. We very often think we made this great presentation or this, ba- this great case, and then we don't say that one last step. So this means that we need to do this. The way forward is, as you've seen from all of this buildup, this is the best approach. Those are the kind of words that people need at the end of a story so that they can end up, because they're playing out multiple scenarios for the end of this story, you have to give them an end. It's so interesting that you say that. You have much more experience in teaching than I do, but for the last couple of years, I've been teaching the Executive Masters for Sustainability Leadership Program at Arizona Mm -hmm. State. And in fact, we're just about ready to graduate our second cohort in two weeks and introduce our next cohort of international executives of the program and of course I teach communications and storytelling and you had said earlier as a teacher you learn end up learning way more from your students than they do from you at least that's been my experience the one thing I've seen in their presentation techniques is this very point that you made here Mm -hmm. is they will make their presentation but at the end of it they won't say and this is what it means this Mm -hmm. is the way forward and this is what I need you to do next And to me, it feels like it's such a lost opportunity. Well, it's a complete lost opportunity because you have not bonded with that student, connected with them, and and made that learning apply to their world right now and show them how to use it. Why do you think we are so reluctant to have that closing statement in our trainings and educations? Because I see it in everyone, not one of them. It's not innate to them to think, to say, this is what it means, here's the way forward, and here's what I need to have you do. You know, that's a really great question, and and I do think it is. um, It's across everybody. I think it has a lot to do with our school system and our culture and that you're not supposed to take a leadership position. We go through most school being taught that, um, you know, we're supposed to fit in. We're supposed to follow the lead of the teacher. We shouldn't have our own ideas. We need to adopt what we're being taught. And so the people who are telling us, here's what you should do next, are the people in authority, and we don't picture ourselves as the people in authority, the ones in charge, until much later in our lives, when really, you're in charge all the time. Mm -hmm. 
you don't learn anything, you don't do anything unless you choose it. And so if you're more conscious of that, then I think you empower yourself. And this is part of bringing out your genius, is to recognize that you do have not only the right, but a responsibility to tell people that this is what they need to do. You know, particularly in the area that you are really good at. You've studied it. Your students did a lot of research. They came up with some important information. And now it's their job to inspire action. And so they have a responsibility to take that last step. And really, they haven't done a good job until they do. And then they go into business, and if they still haven't learned the skill, that's why so many people claim they have bad leaders, because they really, those people haven't given themselves permission to lead. And I think that's really where it comes from. If you're speaking to a business leader, a communicator, and their job is to either you know, be training a corporate group or rallying the forces, as a sales force or whatever, get people going, what are one, two, or three quick tips that you could provide us to say, here are the first three things to think of on a very foundational level to help get your training story straight? Okay, a couple things. Um, pictures are far more powerful than any words you're going to say. So fewer words, more pictures. And remember that we interpret a picture 60,000 times faster than we interpret uh, reading a sentence. So a lot of people fall in love with their words. They're very good at writing long emails, and uh, then they try and put all those words on their PowerPoint presentations. And what people really remember are the pictures. And the pictures can be emotional. They can be metaphoric. It's actually often a far more productive um, expression if you can find a picture that tells the end result that you want instead of just a list of bullet points. So paint a picture for them, something that they can revisit, something that lives in their mind. So find the picture that's in your mind and explain it to them so it gets in their heads too. Another thing is remember attention spans because we are hardwired to look at something else to scan our environment every three seconds. And we do that. We can't help that. So as people have been listening to this uh, this podcast, they've been distracted by other things. That's why we don't remember 100% of anything that anyone teaches us. There's a very rare group of people who do, but most of us, we can't do it because we looked at something else. That means you have to repeat your message. You can't trust that everyone heard it the first time that you said it. So you have to keep hammering back on that same message. So that's two. Um, and then I'm going to add the other one, which you are going to love, is make it into a story. Mm -hmm. Stories are much more memorable than a series of questions. Matter of fact, before human beings could write, we acquired language thousands of years before we could write. Maybe a million years, I'd have to look it up, but a long time. And so the way we taught each other was we told stories, these great old ancient epic poems like Beowulf. That is a story about a people's history. That is how a father told his children who we are and what we believe in and who our gods are and how our society works. It's all in that epic story. And when they heard him tell that story, then they learned it and they told it to their children. And that's how you build corporate culture. That's how you... Um, make connections with human beings. That's how you form relationships the same way. Written word is great for certain things, but it ends at a certain point. At a certain point, it's the connection of the story that matters. A spoonful of story helps the data go down. Absolutely. That's what I said. Listen, we're going to take a quick break here, come back, but what I really want to learn about is you and your work in Brain Matters. Okay. And where our listeners can learn more about you and find out more about the phenomenal work you've done in neuroscience and teaching and learning and how we can use this in advancing all of our missions further faster. Sounds great. Pardon. We'll be back right after this. Did you know that on average, each of us sends around 10,000 emails each year? And what does each message include? Well, an email signature, right? Well, Angie's List realized the reach they had with their 270 employees and decided to use their email signatures to promote their flagship customer event called the Festival of Services. 
Angie's List dialed up Sigster to become mission control for its email signature campaign. In minutes, each employee had a Sigster-powered call to action in their email signature. In six months, the campaign had been viewed more than 2 million times, resulting in 4,500 visits to the registration portal, or 38% of all visits, which meant Sigster drove more engagement than any other tracked marketing activity. Now, if you want to ignite the most ubiquitous and overlooked promotional channel in your business from one simple platform, visit Sigster.com. That's S-I-G-S-T-R dot com. And see how they will help you message, measure, and manage your email signature marketing. Hey, if it's good enough for Angie, it's good enough for me. Your customers, employees, marketing campaigns, partners, and yes, your detractors, they're each telling a story right now about you. Where? On social media, in traditional print publications, in blog posts, on television, basically everywhere. And it's happening 24-7, in real time. Your mission? Track these stories and the sources that share them, smartly manage them, analyze them rapidly and discern what you should do next, what you should do now. No wonder you're tired. Well, Zigna Labs is a real-time, cross-media story tracking platform that makes your life easier. Their solution enables customers to quickly spot trends, see relevant stories unfold, and take action. So stay ahead of what the world thinks with Zignal Labs. Learn more and sign up for a free demo at zignalabs.com forward slash story. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, neuroscience educator, e-learning specialist, and your number one resource to spark the genius inside of you, Margie Meacham. Hey, Park. Margie, now your work, your platform is around brain matters. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I wrote a book about a year ago called Brain Matters, How to Help Anyone Learn Anything Using Neuroscience. And it's doing really well. In fact, I think it helped you find me. Mm -hmm. So, um, And in that, I realized that there was so much more that I had to tell than that one book. I kind of thought that book, you know, well, that covered it. But then I kept finding more things. And I kept having people come up to me saying that book really mattered to them. And they really were excited about the brain and how can they use it better. So I've put together something called Brain Matters Academy. I'm really thrilled that you're going to be one of my instructors, by the way. I'm looking forward to it. And what we're doing is we're going to put together online courses focused on some aspect of your brain and how it works and how you can apply that in a practical way. So we're not interested in teaching um, things that you could find anywhere online, like software applications. We're, we're not doing that. We're very specialized on learning. And everybody that I work with is an expert in their field. And we are going to put together an online place where you can search for courses that are special to you. So if somebody is a teacher and they want to understand how a child learns or how maybe a child with learning disabilities learns, there's courses up there in Brain Matters for that. If you're a parent and you want to help your kid at school or you want to help them build better relationships, there's going to be a course about that. And as business people, there's going to be a lot of courses on how to ignite that inspiration, how to ignite that genius in the people you work with. And to do that, you have to start with yourself. You have to find your own genius first so that then you know how to do it with somebody else. Uh, so we're going to be a great one-stop shop as we continue to grow. So we're looking not only for learners, we're looking for teachers. So mm -hmm. if there's somebody who thinks they have something they're passionate about, I believe everyone has one fantastic course inside them, and that's where their genius is, that one great thing they really know and do well. And there may be several things, but most of us can point to at least one. And so those are the kind of people who are going to be teaching. They're going to be teaching about their sweet spot, the thing they do the best, and you're going to be learning from the best. So they're going to be interactive. They're going to be designed the way the brain learns. And Brain Matters Academy is just a, a pet project of mine I'm really thrilled about. And we're launching in January, so it won't be in long. In January? Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, we'll have courses. The, uh, the pressure is on. Uh, the word will be out. This may be one of the first places you hear about it, but it will certainly not be the last place you hear mm. about it. Well, I like that idea, too, of your philosophy of you have to apply this to yourself first and really understand how it works before you can go out and teach it to others. I've learned that with our story cycle process and, and the work with our students at ASU and the work, with, uh, the work with the brands that we work with. I ask the executives to take this online tutorial first so that they can write their story, as Simon Sinek would say, their why story. Mm -hmm. Why is it they do what they do? And uh, by the way, any listener can go and do this for free. It's, uh, the, the, the website is yourstory.businessofstory.com, and it's this 10-step online uh, program that you go through and write down your story. It first teaches you the structure of story, how it works, you apply it to the best story you know, or the story you know best, I should say, and that's your own personal story. Uh, and then I found what it helps them is really helps center them for what they want to be doing with their business and their organizations. And as soon as they have this appreciation for story structure, they can start seeing this same pattern in the people around them, in their employees and their executives and uh, their stakeholders and their customers. Then it goes back to Joseph Campbell, America's foremost mythologist, and this concept of the universal pattern of the hero's journey, which of course inspired and informed our story cycle. But everything that you've talked about today, I've experienced in one way, shape, or form, either through my own um, experience teaching, my very new experience, last couple, three years of teaching, but my 30 years in teaching brands how to sell themselves and how to author their authentic stories. And it always begins with the person. I think people show up, at least in our line of work, they want to say outwardly, this is what our story we think needs to be. And once we get the process going with them, it quickly turns internal because they realize then that they don't understand even why they're doing it. <laughs> until they have that true appreciation and they get their compass straight, it's hard to get the rest of it straight in the brand world. And I'm assuming that's the same is true in the teaching world. The Absolutely. Academia. Yeah. And um, the brain is very good at recognizing within the first few seconds if someone is faking it. Mm -hmm. If someone is not very excited about their topic uh, and they're teaching it anyway, they're going to teach their students how to be bored with mm -hmm. the topic too. Um, if a manager is saying what they know the company wants them to say, but they really disagree with it, they haven't bought into it, employees will tell that too. Mm -hmm. And so we're very good at reading the underlying uh, thoughts even of another person even more than they may realize. They may not be conscious of it, but we can see it in their body language and in their expression and their choice of words in their eyes. Uh, in all those little things, and we might not be able to put that in words, but it, it comes down to um, to Gladwell's blink in that blink of an I eye. Was just, I, I was scanning that book again last night after reading, and that's exactly what I thought about when you mentioned that. Yeah. Well, you know why that happened, because your waves, your brain waves of mine are really <laughs> in sync right now. So somehow something in my total demeanor triggered that book in your head as I was thinking of it. it. It's really a form of mind reading when it works really well. Hmm. Isn't that well? Yeah. And, and we've all felt that, like you mm -hmm. said, when you had that unbelievable conversation or you've got that professor that you have just loved because somehow you have that connection. It goes back to mm -hmm. your simpatico. There's mm -hmm. something happening with the brain waves. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Margie, this is great. Where can people go right now to learn more about you? They can go to my website, learningtogo.info, and it's T-O-G-O, -O, learningtogo.info. I have a blog. I, uh, they can also find my book on Amazon, Brain Matters, How to Help Anyone Learn Anything Using Neuroscience. And I do a lot of public speaking. If they are professional teachers or corporate trainers or they go to those kind of conferences, they'll probably run into me. Mm -hmm. Now, one last thing. We were talking earlier, and you were giving me the background on the word Genius. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners? Because I thought it was really fascinating. Where does that term come from? Yeah, it's got a really interesting history. Uh, the word first started appearing in the Middle Ages, and they really, of course, that was a very different time. They were very spiritual, and everything came from outside of you. So they believed that a genius was a guardian angel that had come and given you inspiration. That's why you were able to be a great artist or a beautiful singer. You had this angel giving it to you. Then as we became more um, 
science and technology focused and we became a little more aware of how things worked, we began to believe that those wonderful abilities really came from your brain. Um, and so genius became a term for someone who was very intelligent. Then we started to recognize that intelligence has a lot of different forms. And so more recently, we've applied genius to mean an artistic genius or a dance genius. You'll hear athletes called geniuses because uh, they just have these wonderful abilities. So it started to be very broad of anybody with a wonderful ability, which means something you were born with. Um, what we're understanding now is that it's not just a few lucky people who were born with some kind of amazing ability. We're all born with the same ability in our brains. What unfortunately happens, just like you say everyone's born as a wonderful storyteller, and I've heard you say that, well, we're all born with that innate genius too, but unfortunately it usually is not brought out. And so as adults, we have to go through that process of going back and finding it and nurturing it and reigniting it. But genius really means being the best of what you can be, whatever that is. And you help bring out the genius in everyone through the practical application of neuroscience and learning. Absolutely. And what we arrived at earlier that I just love is your mission, I guess, is to turn teachers into learning experts. Yes. So that they're going to be more empowering, more impactful, and create more knowledgeable, enlightened, and enthusiastic students. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us in this week. Uh, business of Stories. It's been marvelous having you here, and I really look forward to your Learning Academy coming out. Yeah, me too. Maybe we'll come back and talk about that once it's up and running. Absolutely. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. Uh, come, you know, join me again next Wednesday when we will have another amazing guest like Margie. And in the meantime, please feel free to share this show with all your friends, family, and your world, which of course will prove your genius in doing that. And if you like what you hear, would love to get your ratings and reviews on iTunes. Uh, that certainly helps in our propagation of this show and letting, letting the rest of the world know that we're here. But thank you, and uh, until next time, I'm Park Howell. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Park & Co., Sixter, Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts. Podcast imaging by... Audio.